um, okay. so if you have one triple bond um, for, for if the carbon carries one triple bond, definitely it's going to be sp. Now, if the, what about this carbon now? What is the hybridization for carbon two here? One, two, SP. and three, also SP, right? This is going to be also SP because it carries one triple bond. What about carbon three? What's the hybridization for carbon three? SP3. Very good, SP3 because there is no pi bond, it's all sigma bond. One sigma bond is shown because it's a structural formula, carbon carbon sigma bond is showing, but the three carbon hydrogen bond is understood. So we know that there are three hydrogen bonds. It just doesn't show in this structure for the sake of the time. Now, the other case that you could have a, uh, you could have uh, SB hybridization is for this carbon. This carbon carries two pi bond. So following the same table I had before, this is going to be SP. This carbon has one double bond or carries one pi bond, three sigma bond is going to be SP2. Okay. This one is going to be SP2. Okay, did they answer your question? Any questions about this? Determining hybridization. You have two ways, either counting number of pi bonds or you're counting number of electron domain. And don't get confused with that. When you are counting number of pi bonds, just any time, if you have a double bond, one is pi, one is sigma. If it's a triple bond, two pi bond, one sigma. But if you are counting electron domain, a double bond counts as one electron group or electron domain. Then you have another electron group, and now three electron groups is going to be sp2. So it depends on what you are, which method you are going to uh, use. And again, some different books they cover differently. But when you take exam, like if you take a PCAT or MCAT, and this is not a PCAT or MCAT class, but is a, is a higher level course, so they are not going to say which teacher was teaching you what, who which book did you use. They're saying, okay, you need to know how to how to determine hybridization. So if you know uh, more than one way, then you just pick the one that is going to make sense, makes more sense to you. And that's how you are going to determine hybridization. And there is no, um, you know, the, the only way. So there is no one way you could have is a science problem. So you could have more than one way to determine the hybridization. So is it safe to say the first bond is always a sigma bond and every other bond after that is going to be a pi bond? Yes, if there is no sigma bond, pi bond is not going to form because these two, uh, P, the, the parallel p orbitals, they are not going to come close to one another if you don't have a sigma bond formed already. So if you have the first bond is always sigma. If gotcha. it's double, then it would be additional would be pi. If it's a triple, then you would have two additional uh, pi bond. Okay, any other questions about hybridization? No? Okay. If you don't have question about hybridization, next is the, we're talking about rotation of the, uh, of the bond. Rotation of the bond around carbon-carbon single bond, this rotation around carbon-carbon single bond is going to be um, free of energy or is allowed, rotation is allowed around carbon-carbon single bond. But if it's a carbon-carbon double bond, there is no, uh, no way that you can, you can rotate the molecule around carbon-carbon um, double bond. So basically you have to break a bond and the new bond has to form. Even though you have the, um, the single bond, when you are rotating, even though it's doable, it's going to rotate all the time on its own um, based on the amount of the energy that it has, and it will look for the most stable situation. There are two, uh, there is a fact that the factor in VSPR, and you learned about electron repulsion. In organic chemistry, the term is called steric hindrance. The groups do not like to be 
close to one another. The further away the groups are from each other, the more stable the molecule is going to be. So if you have, um, if you have these two hydrogens, that they are parallel to each other, they're covering each other, is going to have closer distance to one another. And because they are close to one another, it's causing a steric hindrance and it makes the molecule less stable. But if you have if you rotate it by like 60 degrees, and then you get the, the hydrogens out of each other's way, they are not facing each other, they don't cover each other. The term or the configuration is called. Um, the conformation is called staggered. And when it's staggered, um, like eclipse versus staggered, eclipse would be like you have like covering, uh, the two hydrogens are covering each other like this with the distance, but they are covering each other. But when it's, when it's staggered, like you see this, the, 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 the hydrogens or the bonds, they are not overlapping if you bring the two carbons together the bonds are not overlapping. So if you have the eclipse that you have, these two are covering each other, but when it's staggered, I'm showing with my fingers, I, I will, I can go get the models also for you. Um, when it's showing, even though with the distance, it's called staggered. When it's covering each other, it's called eclipse. A staggered is more stable than the eclipse. Because when it's eclipsed, they, are, they have closer distance. When it's staggered, the distance is going to increase between the groups. And as the distance increases between the groups, the molecule in general is going to be, or overall is going to be more stable. These are the terms that you are going to learn more in depth in the next chapter. But just the fact that you have to deal with this um, rotation around carbon-carbon double bond, it's uh, you know something new you have to learn about it. The when it comes to double bond, there is no way that you can you can rotate it. Like if you have a double bond with the formation of like a scissor trans, if you look at my thumbs, they are further away from each other. They are opposite side, and they that is like is known as a trans molecule. Now if I try to rotate this to bring the thumb up. It's, if you try it yourself, you would see that it's going to actually hurt your fingers, your hands. The only way you can rotate this, if you break one bond, you rotate and then break the, the form new bond to, to bring the thumbs to the same side. So if it's going from, from trans to cis or from cis to trans, bond is broken, new bonds are formed and you see bonds broken and bond forming only in chemical reaction. So a chemical reaction has taken place, basically going from cis to, uh, from trans to cis or from cis to trans, a new compound has formed. A new compound has different melting point, different boiling point. So we have uh, a new compound forming cis and trans are not the same compound because they have different physical property. But eclipse and staggered, these two, they are same compound because this rotation it doesn't take too much energy and you have this like a double arrow, same size. That shows like equilibrium. Your molecule can go from eclipse to staggered, staggered to eclipse because rotation around carbon-carbon single bond, it is free and it does happen all the time because it is in the rotation. It goes from one to the other. Okay. So I already talked about this double bond. Double bond is not, it doesn't rotate. You have to break a bond and then form new bond. Um, the, also, the, the meaning of these solid triangle versus the dash triangle, you don't see this too often in general chemistry, in organic chemistry, in the structure of formula because it's a 3D. They are not in the same plane. You have to show that by drawing the dashes and wages. Wages, if you have a solid triangle, that means this group is coming toward you. 
if it dashes like a dash triangle means it's going away from the plane of your view so it's going away from you and then the the solid triangle angle is coming toward you so if you look at the cis molecule both ch3 are on the same side because it looks like both of them are coming toward you so they are both both of them are on the same side of the plane and if you look at the trans molecule one ch3 is coming toward you the other ch3 is going away from you if is one is coming toward you like this up the other one down the group they have maximum distance like my thumbs here they have maximum distance from each other and that makes the molecule more stable because this molecule, the, the groups do not like to be close to one another because it's causing a steric hindrance. So that would so, be considered staggered, right? It is similar to staggered, okay. but this is a different term. A staggered and eclipse, it's for carbon-carbon uh, single bond. So if this is like a eclipse, the, the two terms are facing each other, and then this would be staggered, but that's for carbon-carbon single bond. When it comes to definition for the carbon-carbon double bond is going to be cis and trans. If the, the two groups are away from each other, it's trans. If they are close to one another, it's going to be cis. If they okay, are on the same you. side, yes, same side would be cis, opposite side would be trans. Does the same rule apply of cis and trans to triple bonds or can they just like, can we still apply those terms if there is a triple bond? Good question. Uh, when you have a triple bond, what's the shape of the molecule? As, oh. It's 180 degree, right? Yeah. For 180 oh, degrees, this linear. is linear, yes is linear and since they are linear you don't have to worry about that so okay. if you have like this uh, two pens okay and the tip is like the the molecules is going to be linear so there is really nothing you can do for a linear molecule to make it closer or or further away from each other for so good question but no okay. you don't have to be worried about the triple bond rotation it's not going to rotate definitely because it's a triple bond and two pi bond has to break before you can rotate. But cis trans does not apply to triple bond. It only applies to double bond. Good okay. question. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, a new term, isomerism. I isomers, what are isomers in organic chemistry? Isomer is considered for molecules that they have um, they have same molecular formula but different structure formula so if you count the number of carbons and hydrogen in this n-pentane you have five carbon and 12 hydrogens for isopentane same thing molecular formula is the same and hydrogen is 12 for neopentane same thing so you have c5h12 based on this example and the definition for constitutional isomers. These are compounds that they do have uh, same molecular formula, but different connectivity. A different connectivity makes it constitutional isomer. If they have same connectivity, but different orientation in space, that will make it geometrical isomers. So cis and trans, these are geometrical isomers because connectivity is the same. This carbon is attached to one hydrogen and one CH3, and the other carbon is attached to one hydrogen and one CH3. If you look at the other side, you have one carbon attached to CH3 and hydrogen, the other one is attached to hydrogen and CH3. So it's the it, connectivity is the same, but orientation is space is different. So this is called geometrical isomers. But when it comes to, uh, to molecules that they have different connectivity, what do you mean by different? What I mean by different connectivity? If you start counting the carbons from uh, left to right here, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, one, two, three, four. So we have five carbons, but carbon two is attached to two other carbons. 
for compound N pentane, but in, in isopentane, carbon two is attached to three other carbon. So connectivity, carbon, carbon, a skeleton is different, but the molecular formula is the same. And that would make the molecule, uh, the two of them isomer of each other. So for cis trans isomers, I kind of said it earlier, but these are geometrical isomers. If the connectivity is the same, but orientation in the space is different, is going to be geometrical. Like cis trans, these are geometrical. But this is structure that the connectivity is different with the other two is going to be constitutional isomer. Because in this case, you have double bond between carbon one and two. In the cis and trans, you have double bond between carbon two and three. So position of the double bond is different. So carbon one here has three hydrogen, carbon one has three hydrogen, but carbon one has two hydrogen. So connectivity is different. The structure of formula is different and that makes it constitutional isomer, but these are geometrical isomer. Geometrical isomers. Questions about the type of isomers? No um, questions? I have a question. Yes. Would you be able to point out the constitutional isomer without seeing the others, the geometric ones? If that makes sense. Uh, one more time, please. I said, would you be able to point out um, which one is like the constitutional isomer without seeing the other isomers? Constitutional isomers, if you see the connectivity is different or like one carbon is attached to two other carbon and another molecule, you get the carbon attached to three other molecules. So you see the connectivity is different. You have like four, four carbon that is CH3 but here you have only three carbon that is CH3. Arrangement of the, of the um, I think the, the best way would be just the connectivity is different. It's not exact same connectivity. So same car carbons are not attached to the similar groups. Like there's a point of difference. If the carbon one here is attached to three uh, hydrogen, here you have three hydrogens and here you have three hydrogens. So up to that point, there is no difference, right? But if you go to carbon two, this is attached to two hydrogens, but this one is attached to one hydrogen. This one has no hydrogen. But molecular formula must be the same, but there is a point okay. of difference in connectivity to what is okay. what other elements are attached. So it makes Thank it you. constitutional, sure. It makes it constitutionalized. And the geometrical connectivity is the same. So carbon one is CH3, carbon two is CH, carbon, uh, carbon two is CH, carbon three is CH, carbon four is CH3. Same thing here, CH3, CH, CH, CH3. But orientation in a space is different. Arrangement in the space is different, but connectivity is the same. Professor, will, will the stereoisomers be in a similar uh, geometrical shape like that one was? Stereo, uh, stereoisomers, they are just a specific case of geometrical. A stereoisomer, there is a condition that they must be mirror image of each other. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah. Right, thank you. Sure. So um, next topic, which is getting close to, your, to the acid-base topic, is the dipole uh, moment, how polar or nonpolar the molecules are. The polarity of the molecule depends on difference in electronegativity of the atoms that they are forming the bond. So the greater the electronegativity uh, or the greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond is. Now, do you, if the, the electronegativity is given and you have a calculator, you can find the difference between the uh, electronegativity of the two atoms that forming the bond. That is going to just make it very simple. The greater this difference, the more polar the bond is. If you don't have it, then you just have to uh, kind of estimate that. 
based on the periodic table, the highest electronegativity is found on the top right of the table for fluorine. If you go down, electronegativity decreases. If you go to left, electronegativity decreases, and then you can just get that. Just know that hydrogen and carbon, they both have electronegativity of two point. Uh, they're very close to one another. It's like a, the, the, the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5, and that makes the molecule to be, the, the bond to be nonpolar. That's why for hydrocarbons, when you have only carbon and hydrogen, the molecule is nonpolar molecule. But when you bring halogen, when you bring nitrogen, you bring oxygen, you make the molecule polar molecule. Um, in order to find your molecule is polar or not polar, you need to have a structure formula. Um, and with the structure formula, you can say if the electron distribution is even or uneven, um, like for CO2, okay, that's one way. There are a couple of ways, again, to determine if your molecule, if the loose structure is given, you can find out if the molecule is polar, nonpolar, or if you have the loose, if you don't have it, you just draw the loose structure and then say your molecule is polar, nonpolar. Uh, if you know the hybridization, like carbon, can you tell me what's the hybridization for carbon in this molecule of CO2? SP. SP, very good. And SP, that means two electron group, and if the, or two hybrid orbital because you have S and P orbital mixing together, giving you two SP orbitals. So if this two is going to be occupied similarly, then the molecule would be nonpolar. So if you have O double bond on the right side, O double bond on the left side, they are occupied similarly is going to be nonpolar. So CO2, the mu or, um, or the dipole moment is zero for the molecule because distribution of the electrons are um, the same. But if you look at this compound here for formaldehyde, oxygen has higher electronegativity, so it's going to pull the electrons stronger. Hydrogen is not going to be, is not very strong to pull the electrons. So this side of the molecule is going to be negative. The other side of the molecule is going to be positive. And the overall distribution of electron is uneven the molecule is not symmetrical in terms of the electron density. As a result, the molecule is known to be polar molecule. Why do we know? Why do we need to know if the molecule is polar or nonpolar? Because if the molecule is polar, it's going to have different type of intermolecular forces. It's going to have like dipole-dipole interaction. If it's nonpolar, it's going to be only Van der Waals forces. You have learned about intermolecular forces in general chemistry. And if it's dipole-dipole stronger, what does it mean? That compound, a compound that has dipole-dipole interaction is going to have higher boiling point, is going to be have more higher solubility in polar solvent versus a molecule that is nonpolar. If it's nonpolar, it's going to have lower um, or weaker intermolecular forces, weaker intermolecular forces would yield to um, lower boiling point as well. So if your molecule has lone pair, that's another indication that your molecule is going to have in this under central atom, let me correct that. Lone pair uncentral atom is going to make the molecule polar because for CO2, here you do have lone pairs, but those lone pairs are on the domain element, not on the central atom. But for a molecule like ammonia, when you have pair of unshared electron and nitrogen, if you have sp3 hybrid here, um, you have four hybrid orbital, they are not occupied similarly, this molecule is going to be polar. And the overall polarity the top side of the molecule is going to be negative. The bottom part is going to be positive because hydrogen, they have lower electronegativity compared to nitrogen. Electrons are pulled toward the nitrogen and the pair of electrons that you have up there, it makes it even a stronger polarity there. Isn't there some simple math you could do to figure out if it's polar or nonpolar? 
Definitely you can. I that's think... for, but that is for bond only. That's okay. only for the bond, not for the molecule. Okay. If it's if it's a molecule, then you have to find the the using your simple math. It could be used, but it's going to be a little bit more complicated because you have to uh, understand the shape of the molecule, also. Um, so what we are doing here, just estimating and determining, like generally, is this molecule going to be polar, non-polar? Because if it's polar, then we can um, dissolve it in the polar solvent. If it's non-polar, no attempt, don't, don't even try it. It's not going to solve in polar salt. I have a question. So sure. ionic molecules are mainly polar, right? So then for covalent, will we be looking at both of the um, elements individually to figure out if they're, they're polar okay. or not polar? Very good question. Ionic compounds, they have, extreme, they have extreme polarity. Extreme case of polarity, where the one side of the molecule gains like positive charge and we don't say a, a um, delta positive or delta negative, we just say positive or negative, like NaCl, you don't say delta, you just say negative and positive. There's a transfer of electron. When we are in organic chemistry, we don't talk about ionic bond unless you make the salt of organic compound, which in that case, of course, you have an ionic compound. But 99% of the time we are dealing with molecular compound in organic chemistry. And then when we are talking about intermolecular forces, as a result, we would look for only for the London dispersion, dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding would happen for the molecules that they do contain oxygen, uh, hydrogen attached directly to the oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine. And these two are, uh, you know, not that, this one is not that popular. For amines, we do have NH. For alcohols, we have OH and carboxylic acid. So to answer your question, these uh, ionic compounds, they are extreme case of the polarity, and that is correct. But we don't deal with them often in organic chemistry. We deal, the strongest intermolecular force that we have is coming from hydrogen bonding. It's very strong compared to the other two, dipole-dipole and the London dispersion. The weakest one is London dispersion. Weak intermolecular forces would yield for a molecule to have lower melting point, lower boiling point, and it's easy to separate from each other to change it to the vapor phase and all that. The intermolecular forces is going to affect melting point, boiling point, and solubility. The stronger intermolecular force is going to have high melting point, high boiling point. Like intermolecular forces is going to dissolve in like. So solubility, they just have to be similar in order to dissolve. If you have alcohol, alcohol would dissolve in water. If you have hexane, it would dissolve in oil. So the intermolecular forces, they are, they are similar, the solubility goes high, increases for similar intermolecular force. And how do we determine intermolecular forces? You have to know the structure for the, uh, for the molecule. And if we know the strength of intermolecular forces, then we can predict physical properties. What type of compounds they have dipole-dipole interaction? That is for, can you tell me which type of compounds they have dipole-dipole interaction? Hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons, dipole-dipole. Dipole-dipole, that means that your molecule has dipole. That means your molecule is polar. So only for polar molecular compounds. So Water. this compound here, this compound here, because it's nonpolar as a hydrocarbon, because it's nonpolar, this is a nonpolar compound. And because it's nonpolar, it doesn't have dipole-dipole. It has London dispersion. But this compound here, which is alkyl halide because of the halogen, is a polar compound. And if it's a polar compound, the intermolecular force is stronger. What happens as a result, 
the boiling point is going to increase by 35. So you have a 35 degree boiling point for this compound, but for this compound, you have four carbon, but boiling point is zero. The stronger the dipole moment, or the more polar the compound is, the higher the boiling point. So this compound, very similar to the, the isopropyl um, or two chloropropane, um, very similar to acetone in terms of the, the mass and the structure, but because of the high electronegativity of the oxygen, it makes this molecule more polar. And because it's more polar, look at the boiling point has it's increased. So what you want takes, to take away from this it's is- because it takes more energy, right? The, 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 what you want to take from this is the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, higher the melting point. But to answer your question, the what is intermolecular force? Intermolecular force is attraction force between two molecules. And attraction forces, these are electrostatic attraction. What does it mean? Is attraction between opposite charges. If it's attraction between opposite charges, the greater those charges are, attraction is going to be bigger. stronger. Yes, bigger. So it's like if you are getting, if you are being like electrocuted by the main power line or by what voltage of the lightning or like by very small, you know, exposure to the electricity in using, you know, a device in the kitchen. So it's different. So the, the degree of the, or the attraction, electrostatic attraction, it depends on the polarity of the molecule. The higher the polarity, the stronger the intermolecular um, uh, forces because the electrostatic attraction is stronger, is more significant. So what you need to know, for sure from like this is a slide that dipole-dipole interaction, it only happens for molecules that they are polar, molecular compound. Hydrogen bonding, I already told you, you are looking for hydrogen attached to fluorine, hydrogen attached to nitrogen, or hydrogen attached to oxygen. Like this molecule here, it has hydrogen, it has oxygen, it has carbon, but there is no hydrogen bonding here because oxygen is not directly attached to hydrogen. So there is no, uh, no, no hydrogen bonding here. If we had a hydrogen bonding here, this is going to move to like 80 degree because is hydrogen bonding is stronger than dipole dipole and dipole dipole is stronger than London dispersion. What type of molecule would have London dispersion would be nonpolar compound like CO2. CO2 is gas at room temperature. Why is a heavy, heavy molecule considering like comparing to water CO2 is a heavy molecule, has a molar mass of 44 gram per mole, but water is only 18 gram per mole. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but CO2 is gas at room temperature. You have to put lots of pressure and cold and make it very cold before it can change to liquid. So it has a very, very low boiling point because is nonpolar, and if it's nonpolar, it only has London dispersion. So you need to know the intermolecular forces or be able to predict the intermolecular forces for a molecule before you can um, pr predict the physical behavior and physical property of that compound. What would be the approximate boiling point? Or if you are comparing two molecules, which one would have higher boiling point? And would this compound be soluble in water or not? If it's not soluble in water, that means it's not polar enough to dissolve in water. Professor, so um, polar a polar molecule is way more electronegative than a nonpolar molecule. Is that correct? Electronegative, uh, a polar molecule, that means the difference in electronegativity between the atoms and is the great. electron dis, uh, is, is, is higher than like 0.5 and the electron distribution is not even. In order to have a polar molecule, first condition is you must have a polar bond. But there is a second condition also. The, the polar bond must be 
the, the, it must be like unevenly distributed. So let's say we cannot just say any compound that has a C O double bond will be, this is a polar bond, right? Any compound that has C O double bond is polar? The answer is no. It depends on what else is on the other side. So if you have another C O double bond here, then this becomes nonpolar. But if you have a CO double bond on this side and you have two hydrogen on the other side, this becomes polar. So in order for your molecule to be polar, must have a polar bond and you are right in that case. Okay. But okay. that's not the only condition. That's the primary condition. Secondary condition, you must have uneven distribution of the electrons then it's a, the molecule cannot be symmetrical. If it's a symmetrical, even though you have a polar bond, the molecule is not polar. Got it, thank you. Um, sure. Then London dispersion. London dispersion, it happens uh, or it uh, exists among non-polar compounds. This, like this is like a temporary or momentary uh, dipole or the polarity that it forms, it goes away, it forms, it goes away. And uh, the effect of it, what type of compound would have greater London dispersion? The, the London dispersion uh, exists among all compounds, all compounds. It's like water, carbon dioxide, methane, propane, hexane, everything contains, car uh, everything has London dispersion. But for water, you have two types. You have hydrogen bonding and you have, uh, you have hydrogen bonding and you have London dispersion. But for carbon dioxide, you only have London dispersion because it's nonpolar compound. So is the only intermolecular force for, for nonpolar compound, but is one of the intermolecular forces for all compounds. The trend. If you, in comparison, a molecule with higher mass or molecular weight or molar mass is going to have a stronger London dispersion. Now, if you draw the structure for ethane, is a CH3, CH3, and this molecule is nonpolar. Boiling point for this compound is 183, minus 183. Hexane is also carbon hydrogen. You have six carbon and 14 hydrogen for hexane. Any compound that is only carbon and hydrogen, it would be nonpolar. But how come the boiling point is higher? You see, because it's negative value, you have good math. You already told me you have better math. So uh, this is a greater value. The boiling point has increased from going from ethane to hexane because ethane C2H6, but hexane has six, the carbon and 14 hydrogen. The larger the molecule, the greater the London dispersion. And uh, as a result, higher boiling point, higher melting point. A, a uh, larger molecule, which has a lot more, this is the complex. See, anywhere you see angle, there's a carbon. So you have uh, a... Uh, combination of like a 24 to 30 carbons, this is solid at room temperature, is going to have a very high melting point, much higher, about 150 degree higher, and the boiling point is about 400. What is changing among these compounds, even though they are all nonpolar compounds, is the size. So the greater the size or the greater the molar mass, the stronger the London dispersion and a strong London dispersion, it would result in um, higher boiling point and higher melting point. Questions? That's the primary factor. We have primary factor, we have secondary factor. Please take notes when you're watching video, you're watching me, take notes because I, I refer to it as, as a primary factor, secondary factor. And the primary factor was the size that affects the London dispersion forces. Secondary factor is branching. The more branching, more round shape, less contact area, lower 
the London dispersion. So London dispersion forces are weaker for a round molecule compared to the same size by number of carbons, of course. Same size, so this is also C5H12. This is a C5H12. This is more extended. This is more round. If it's round, you have less contact area. If it's straight like this, it's going to have greater contact area. Boiling point for lower branch or normal alkane is going to be higher than a branched alkane. So branching decreases the boiling point. Um, branching would decrease the boiling point. That's a secondary factor. First, you have to look at the number of carbon. So if you had like a C6H14, that would be higher than the, this, than this, because you have six carbon. You have five, when you have five carbon, compare apple to apple. You compare five carbon straight, five carbon round. Compare five, six carbon straight versus six carbon round, but you can't compare the uh, five carbon straight with six carbon round. So you have to compare like apple to apple. That's what they say. So the boiling point goes down or up? I'm sorry. For I'm round, not... it goes down. Why is that? Because the contact area, the London dispersion is, is like momentary and the molecule needs to be disturbed. So if it's more contact area, it's going to be disturbed by other molecule. But if it's round, they just kind of touch each other and they, they live along. They, there is not much of interaction between the molecules because they don't touch each other, it's round. And it's round when there's more branching, right? So that's more why- More branching means round, yes. Round or more and branching, same thing. Yes. So more branching, decreases the contact areas? Yes, decreases the contact area and at the same time decreases the boiling point, yes. Okay, thank you. And that is a secondary factor. The primary factor is the molar mass. The greater the molar mass is going to be um, the higher the intermolecular forces or London dispersion. Okay. Uh, questions about dipole, 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 it happens with, for the polar molecular compound. London dispersion for non-polar molecular compound and hydrogen bonding is between the molecules that they have OH or NH. This red colors dotted line, that is basically the hydrogen bonding, the force that holds this molecule to this molecule. So the, the red color that you see between two molecules. Intermolecular forces is attraction between two molecules, not inside one molecule. So when you are trying to boil a compound, you are breaking the bond that holds the molecule together. Because when you boil water, it changes to water vapor, you still have water molecule. You just separate the water molecule and let them free and they're now in the gas phase or vapor phase. When you bring it together, you have to lower the temperature, you bring it together, would put lots of pressure or, or lower temperature to have them stay together. But if you give enough energy, they would separate. It's just that because hydrogen bonding is a strong, compounds that they do have hydrogen bonding, they have high boiling point. And we already talked about the OH and NH. Questions? Any questions you might have? If you don't have question, can you answer this question? Uh, how could you justify a 78 versus 25? Boiling point of 25 minus 25 and boiling point of 78. They both have 46 gram per mole molar mass. Well, the right one has one more. The left one has one more hydrogen, correct? No. No. I think isn't isn't the hydrogen uh, bonding? Is, is a is a C two H five H six O, and this one is a C two H six O. I put the molar mass is the same, molecular formula is the same, but this one has more higher boiling point. 
boiling point? How do you justify it? Maybe it has to do with the branching? No. No, because they're both the same. What is the primary factor? Primary factor is the type of intermolecular force. So it's the hydrogen yeah. bonding, right? Type of intermolecular forces. This one has hydrogen bonding. This molecule okay. has dipole, dipole. Yeah. Which one is the stronger? Dipole, dipole. Hydrogen bonding hydrogen is bonding strongest. Is the strongest. Okay. Yeah. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest. Then is dipole dipole, and the last one is London dispersion. That's why it's good to do end of the chapter problems because each problem it, it brings like a new uh, picture, new image, and then you have to justify it. You have to to basically answer, and then you kind of repeat what you have you have learned. It's a lot to memorize. You just have to apply to problem solving, and then it will stay with you for a longer time. So this is a good practice. Let's so look at the next one. What do you think of this? This compound has 78, but very similar in boiling in the molar mass. The molar mass the two, two compounds are very similar. There is a 60 degree difference almost, or 61 degree difference in boiling point. So How wouldn't it be justify this? Wouldn't it be the same thing because it's a hydrogen bonding? This is a H bonding, also. It's got more because you have an NH, right? Because right. you have an NH. Here you have an OH and you have H bonding. So both of them is hydrogen bonding. The only difference is in this case that this hydrogen bonding for OH is stronger than NH. Why? Because charge separation is greater for OH, you get higher uh, charge separation for OH compared to the NH. And the because of the electronegativity of oxygen is greater mm -hmm. than electronegativity of nitrogen. So ammonia is, is like gas at room temperature, but water is liquid at room temperature. So you can also look at that, just a real life example. Ammonia is gas, it has very strong odor because it's very volatile, but water is very stable. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Hydrogen bonding that is coming from OH is stronger than the hydrogen bonding that is coming from NH. So that these are the secondary factor. Primary factor, it's here, the type of intermolecular forces. If you come to a type position that both of them are hydrogen bonding, now which one is the stronger hydrogen bonding? And this, for, when it comes to hydrogen bonding is different from the, uh, from the London dispersion. For London dispersion, if you have two molecules that they have both London dispersion, then you have to look at the mass first. If the mass is the same, you look for shape. The greater the mass, the greater the London dispersion. And then when it comes to same mass, you look for the, the fact that which one is more round and which one is more flat. I, sorry. So on the top one, why did the ethanol have a higher boiling point? No H bonding. Oh, okay. So when it's the H bonding, because it takes so much more energy for the forces to uh, be broken apart, that's why the temperature, the boiling point is higher, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, There's so that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it then. So that way, you know, when it comes down to these bondings, I think the higher and the stronger the forces are, the more obviously the, the melting point is going to be. Higher, yes. Right. Professor, if, if ethyl amine wasn't a hydrogen bonding, that would be a bigger molecule, right? And that would have a higher boiling point if it wasn't a hydrogen bond. Um, the difference is you have like 16 plus one, that's 17. And here is a 14 plus two is like 16. It's just one unit. It's not a huge difference. It's not <laughs> considerable. Yeah. But the, the factor, um, yeah, about one unit that could affect. But the, the more significant one uh, effect is the type of the hydrogen bonding is coming from OH versus NH. I gotcha, I gotcha, okay, cool. Very good. Polarity affects the solubility. Like dissolves in, like polar compound dissolves in polar solvent and non-polar would dissolve in non-polar. 
because if one is polar and the other one is non-polar, they separate from each other. There is no communication. They cannot talk to each other. They have to have same or similar intermolecular forces in order to blend in and be soluble. Okay. Functional group. That's the functional group is the last part of the, the chapter. Let me see if we have more of the, what you were asking me. No, I have to, I have to bring a couple of slides. If it's not covered in chapter one PowerPoint, if it's covered, it's covered, you just watch that. If it's not covered in chapter one, the acid base, I will, um, I will add to the next presentation. The, which is basically is like an aerial. And with the aerial is the atom that the hydrogen is attached, the resonance, the... Um, Do we need to... Hybridization. Yes. Do we need to learn the PKAs? Uh, like are we, or not learn, but like memorize certain PKAs? No, not the values. Not the values, but you need to know that the lower the pKa means a strong, um, a strong acid. If you know what does it mean, then it's going to help you to be able to answer the um, answer the question. If you don't know what pKa means or how uh, does it affect the value of it, the affects the acidity, is not going to you won't be able to answer a question that is asking the comparison of the acids. Okay. Okay, uh, functional group, we have hydrocarbons and we have oxygen containing compounds, then we have nitrogen containing compounds. And for all of that, um, for right now, just you have to recognize the, the functional group later on, you have to know them by, uh, by heart. So, I'm just going to outline and you are going to memorize it and know the, the difference. Like alkane, then you have cycloalkane, alkene, cycloalkene. Alkene carries one carbon carbon double bond. This is actually cycloalkene. And then alkane is all single bond and is not cyclic system. If it says cycloalkane, all single bond, but it is a ring. And uh, alkyne, triple bond, that's triple bond. Aromatic, it has a benzene ring part of the molecule. So one time if I say it, or three times if I say it, you're not going to memorize it here in class, but you are going to spend some time on that and try to memorize it. These are organic compounds containing oxygen. That would include the alcohol, with the OH functional group. This is actually the, the spreadsheet that um, Laurie gave us. It had to do something similar to this. Mm. Yes, so the functional a, groups, very good. Yeah, it was kind of like an extra credit assignment. Mm -hmm. So you have the ether where oxygen is attached to two other carbon. Then you have aldehydes and ketones. So you have CO double bond. If it's attached to one hydrogen and one carbon with the aldehyde, but if it's attached to two carbon, it would be uh, ketone. Where is the ketone? Right here. This is a ketone. And this one is aldehyde. One hydrogen and one R group. Carboxylic acid is CO double bond and OH. And acid derivative like acid chloride and ester, amide. Just have to recognize the, the function. What is functional group? Functional group is any element or group of elements other than carbon hydrogen. So you have to look at that as the, other than just carbon hydrogen single bond. So if you have your molecule have contained something other than carbon hydrogen single bond, it would, it would be considered as a functional group. And like in this case, OH, that's the functional group. In this case, you have O, that's the functional group, but it's attached to two other carbons. Like in this case, you have a CO double bond is attached to hydrogen and CH3. Okay, 
um, eventually we all have to cover, you know, same thing because it's the, the chapters or the competency that needs to be covered in the organic, uh, organic chemistry uh, one. Uh, the order might be slightly, slightly different, but um, as I said, I have to get the book and, and make sure that if there's anything missing, I have to add it because they moved from um, when they're changing the edition. They make some changes because, you know, the old book now is probably half the price of the new book. So if they, if, if they make us or make the students to buy the new book, there should be like enough changes to convince people to go to the new book. So that could be the reason. Com compounds containing nitrogen now. So when it's classified, it can, it can make it slightly easier for you. And these are the compounds that they contain nitrogen. It could be amines, it could be amide. Amines and amide. Amines is just the nitrogen carbon bond. It depends on how many nitrogen carbon you bond you have. It could be primary or secondary amine. And then amide is a carbon nitrogen bond, but the carbon is, is like a CO double bond attached to the nitrogen. Uh, last slides, these are the summary or sample problems. Uh, you can determine the hybridization based on, these are solved problems, but you can determine the hybridization. And it gives the summary. We talked about this, which one is like the single bond, double bond or triple bond, which one is the longest, which one is the strongest and all that. The strength of the bond is like, if you say the triple bond, for example, if it's the triple bond is 967 kilojoule per mole, what it means is that if you wanna break a triple bond, you have to spend about a thousand kilojoule. And that makes it to triple bond to be stronger than double bond because you can break this with the 728. And the single bond is easier to break. The bond angle is important for you to know for SP hybridization is 180 or linear shape, trigonal planar and tetrahedral. Functional group shown with different color, it just stands out, makes it easier for you to see where the functional group and why this is called ether functional group, for example. And these are the tables that it can help you to, to memorize better. And uh, like the family name, if you have carbon, carbon double bond is going to be alkene, triple bond would be alkyne, and then all for OH would be alcohol and so on. PKA value is, uh, determines the acidity. Higher PKA, meaning lower acidity. So if the PKA is about 60, that's a very high number. And uh, you have for water is, 15.7. So anything lower than this is going to be acidic, lower than water. Um, so pKa of 10 for phenol or about 5 for carboxylic acid. pKa for a strong acid, they usually don't use pKa value. They just say like a pH stuff, but it's less than zero. And these are not minus. These are about. So Alkene is about 60, alkene is about 44. Um, so this is a sp3 hybrid, sp2 hybrid. Which one is more acidic? 
sp3 hybrid hydrogen carbon that carries the hydrogen or sp2 which one is more acidic sp2 sp2 is more acidic because it has lower pka so if you don't have the pka value if this is not given to you as long as you know this is sp2 versus sp3 you would say sp2 this hydrogen is more acidic okay more acidic because is sp2 hybrid what about sp hybrid this hydrogen that is attached to sp hybrid carbon is going to be a lot more acidic than the sp2 and a lot more than sp3 so the more s character in the hybridization more acidic hydrogen okay the hydrogen is going to be more acidic so that's for just the hybridization effect and like in general this is just a general idea for alcohol the acidity is almost like water and then for other compounds you could have carboxylic acid is stronger than stronger acid than than water. Okay.